Good afternoon. My name is Tony Merlika. I'm the program chair of the Guild of New Hampshire Woodworkers. Uh, we're in Concord, New Hampshire today at the uh, Regional Tech Center. And uh, the afternoon program is by Mike DiMaggio. Uh, Mike is going to talk about how to uh, refurbish old antique hand tools as well as furniture. Mike. Thank you, Tony. And of course, we'll start with the oldest planes, which are the, <clears throat> the all wooden planes. <clears throat> now, this was a plane that I got when I was on a going auction hunting up in Maine. And it's a smoother, regular hand plane, solid beach. When I got it, it was black. It was all encrusted with mold. Um, I only started refurbishing it uh, last week. I just did the one side. I took all the mold off of it. I haven't flattened the sole yet. I did, I did sharpen the blade. Uh, but what I found very interesting about this plane was, was how dense the beach was. Really, really quality wood. Whoever picked out this piece of wood, the maker, whose names incidentally are stamped in here, picked out a really good quality piece of beach that has stayed check free probably for almost a hundred years and really produced a beautiful, a beautiful piece. Uh, what I like about these kinds of planes are is that the feel to them, the wood in and of itself is wonderful to touch. It's very different from working with a steel plane and they're pretty forgiving. If you, you know, you drop it, it doesn't, crack like a steel plane does. If you get a ding in it, you can actually sand the ding out. You can flatten the end every year and it doesn't take four hours to do it on a granite plate with a 60 grit sandpaper, which is really nice. You can run it over your joiner two seconds and you have a flat bottom. Um, but they're really, really nice to work with. They take very nice shavings and there's a lot of them out there. There's a tremendous number of these planes out there. You just have to know what you're looking for. You want a solid wood, you want beech, you want white oak, which is very uh, uh, pertinent in, uh, in Japanese plane making. They use a, a lot of white oak for their plane making and also for their handles, and some red oak. What about hornbeam? I haven't really seen, the only hornbeam ones I know of is that there's, there's one called Ehrlich. Ehrlich, they make hornbeam planes. Emmerich, that's it. It's, a Ger I think, a German company, and they make a hornbeam. A hornbeam also is an excellent, really hard. It's great for tools, for handles. What about locusts? I've never seen one out of locusts, and I, and I really couldn't tell you if I could identify that in a plane. Very hard. Um, any, any wood that's really hard and dimensionally, dimensionally stable is great for plane making. Uh, in our um, hand tools uh, group, we recently purchased some blanks out of uh, English Beach, which we were very fortunate to get our hands on to make a, uh, a copy of a plane. I have a friend of mine who's, a, uh, who's really a, a remarkable collector of antique tools. And he had this Dutch plane from 1674, I think it was, um, that he allowed us actually to photograph and... To, Thank you very much. 1682, uh, that he allowed us to photograph and take dimensions on, and we're, we're, we're in the process of making that plane in the group, which is a lot of fun. Very challenging because there's a lot of carving. You have these huge volutes on the side, and a little bit out of my skill level, but hopefully some of you guys that are much better at it than I am will, will help me. Um, so you have a lot of these kinds of planes. I didn't bring, I have a huge collection of, uh, of molding planes. Um, when you're looking for molding planes, the important thing to look for again is the density of the wood. Make sure they're made out of, the, the best ones are made out of beech. You also have to make sure that sometimes on the bottom there's an insert that gives you a reference point. Sometimes that insert is missing. If you're skilled enough to put it back in there, fine. If you're not, don't buy the plane. Um, you want to make sure that the iron isn't rusted to death. A lot of times when you purchase a tool, 
and you don't really get to see the whole tool uh, disassembled, the iron may be really, really pitted, which makes it difficult to sharpen, especially if it's on towards the tip and compromises the, you know, the quality of the steel. So you really want to be able to get uh, a tool that can be refurbished but doesn't have like a, enormous problems with it. Then we go to the transitional plane. Stanley was very famous for that, where they incorporated um, metal with the wood. Again, the beauty of it is this is also beach. And you can just see, now I haven't done anything to this plane yet. I just purchased this plane. The bottom, just from planing, is already burnished smooth. It's a beautiful, beautiful wood. Uh, I just sharpened the blade just to see how it, it would work. And it takes pretty good shavings. And for a plane this old, when I put a square on it, it was almost dead, dead square, which is impressive, telling you the stability of the wood. My suggestion to you is if you're interested ever in going for antique tools, bring a small square with you and bring a small straight edge. A square to make sure that the, uh, the sole is parallel to the sides. The straight edge to make sure that there's no huge dips anywhere on the sole especially in the front. I know sometimes people are into, you know, they get a, a, an older plane, they are into flattening it, and they will spend days trying to flatten the entire sole of the plane. And that's fine, and for aesthetics, it's wonderful. But the most important part is what's in front of the blade. If you can get that part flat and there's just a slight hollow in the back, you're fine. You're going to be able to plane accurately. So you don't have to go crazy all the time in flattening the entire length of the sole, even in the back. If the front of that uh, plain sole is flat and polished, and the back is relatively flat and polished, even if there's a slight hollow in the middle, the flat part on the sides will be a sufficient enough reference so that you'll be able to plane accurately. This was a plane. I was actually at the Brimfield auction. Has anybody gone to that? Do they know about Brimfield? It's an amazing auction, mostly for furniture. But there's usually about maybe 10 or 15 little tents with tools. And I went there, and there was a guy, an old guy with a beard, smoking a pipe, hanging out, didn't look very interested. And he had a whole cache of old planes. So I looked at this. This is a Stanley number no. 4. For me, the hallmark feature of plane shopping is what does the tote and the knob look like? Why do I say that? Well, first of all, the value of a plane increases exponentially when you have a really good tote and a knob, and it increases even more exponentially when that tote and knob are rosewood. Both these are solid Indian rosewood, which is very hard to come by. The plane bottom was flat, put my square on it. There was plenty of blade left, and this will refinish into a magnificent plane. I figured he was going to ask for $40, $45. I said, sir, what would you like for this? He goes, can you give me $15? Couldn't get into my pocket fast enough. So the, this is the kind of a buy that you really want to look for. Quality, rosewood totes and knobs. And you have to look very carefully because some people are very uh, skilled at repairing the tote. What they will do is, is they will re-glue it, usually with epoxy if they know what they're doing. And then after they re-glue it, they will sand it. And they sometimes they'll fill it with wax or they'll fill it with shellac or they'll even fill it with like a liquefied epoxy and then re-sand it again. You'll never, never, never see the crack. What I do is, is I bring a blue light, uh, which you, you can see like glue and, and such underneath the blue light. That blue light helps sometimes in showing me if there was a, a, if there was a crack. Yes, sir? Is that blue or ultraviolet? Probably ultraviolet. I say blue, ultraviolet. Thank you. Um, and it works great. Uh, because you do not want to buy a plane that has a cracked tote. When you can buy a plane like this that doesn't. Now, at that same man's desk was this plane. 
which as you most of you know is a circular plane and compass plane and they don't come all that readily and it was rusted to death in fact the way I, pick, I thought I had pictures of it somewhere yes <clears throat> when I bought it it looked like this okay it was a mess I couldn't get anything apart and I said oh shit did I make a mistake and the other side was like that I said well I don't think so I have good feelings I want this plane so I soaked it. Now, I usually use um, distilled white vinegar. And the reason I use distilled white vinegar is that I've used muriatic acid. I've used, uh, what's that proprietary stuff that they sell? Um, Evaporust. When I use some of the other substances, I find that it leaves a very dull grayish patina on the metal, which I don't really like. And the only way that I've effectively been able to get rid of that is either I have to wire brush it on my, on my uh, brass brush or I have to really kind of scrub it with oil and very, very fine steel wool. So it takes a tremendous amount of work and time on my part. All I did with this was soak it in white vinegar and then I cleaned it off with a brass brush. I haven't done anything else to this other than after I dried it off, I put some wax on it. So I find that vinegar as an anti-rust agent is very, very effective because it not only removes the rust, but what it does is it gives you much less work to do if you're looking to refurbish the tool. Pardon me, sir? I had it in for about half a day. That's all. Yes, sir? Do you dilute the vinegar mix? No, I, straight. Okay. And, and after I use it, I, I siphon it through paper towels and use it again because it really doesn't lose strength. Yes, sir? Yes, when I do a wooden plane, yeah, only, only the metal parts go in, not the handle. But this is, this is all metal, so that's why it was immersed. Yes, Gary? How long do you keep it in the solution? On an Usually average? 12 hours. Uh, and I'll periodically check. And, and what I'll do to check is I'll take it out course I have a glove on my hand because otherwise I have no fingers left and then I'll take fine steel wool and I'll just start rubbing it gently you'll find with the fine steel wool if the, if the uh, rust is emulsified sufficiently it kind of just almost wipes right off great and that's kind of your key to knowing okay it's been in long enough you can take it out and then you can actually clean it with just the vinegar and, and then the fine steel wool but as soon as you do that you must, you must, you must either oil it or wax it. Because once you've removed that protective kind of patina from the rust and you're exposing it to the elements, it's going to rust much faster than a regular tool would because now it's been kind of acidified by the, by the chemical in the, in the vinegar. So please put a, some kind of a coating on it. Yes, Emery. No, vinegar, no. Oh, muriatic acid, yes. Vinegar, no. I don't do it outdoors. Really? Vinegar and steel wool? Oh, good to know. Thank you. Yes, sir. I've done that once. Uh, have we tried electrolysis? And I said, yes, I've tried it once. I didn't find it as complete. You mean? The other metals? Okay. <clears throat> so here I got <clears throat> this one. I think he charged me 20 and this one 15. So for $35, I have well over 200 plus dollars in, in planes once they're refurbished and, and their quality. I mean, everything on this plane worked, which I didn't know initially. And, that, and that's always the problem. Like now I oiled this. Let me talk to you a little bit about oiling too. <clears throat> One of the best substances that I've ever used is um, Bow Shield T9. And the reason I like that so much is 
it always leaves a kind of a waxy coat on the threads on the metal. I use it predominantly to uh, lubricate anything that's um, threaded or that has movable parts. Now, my esteemed friend Peter would say to me, Michael, you don't know what you're talking about. You want PB Blaster. And you know what? He's absolutely correct for rust uh, pr uh, prohib prohibiting rust or for breaking it apart. The problem with PB Blaster is it stinks. I was using PB Blaster one time. My wife came downstairs and she turned around and went upstairs and said, why'd you leave? She says, it stinks down here. <clears throat> and I find that it, that smell kind of lingers. So when you're doing tools, the last thing you want to do is, is, is refurbish a tool and make it stinky. So, so in deference to my buddy, uh, I have no longer used PB Blaster for tool refurbishment and I use the T9, which I think really does a great job and it has that lingering effect of having that you know the waxy part to it t9 it's by bow shield it's air it's uh they use it on air, aircraft uh t9 t9 bow shield b-o-e-s-h-i-e-l-d okay uh next so let me just go through a little bit about planes one of the most important things that I found out, unfortunately, by accident, is that every plane that you buy, even though it's a Stanley, even though it's a Bailey, isn't the same in terms of the quality of the casting. I thought, oh, you know, Stanley made millions of planes. They were made with fairly good controls. I'm sure they're all the same. Wrong, they're not. What I found out is, is that many planes have very different casting dimensions in the body. And how did I find this out? <clears throat> I had purchased, this is a Stanley four and a half, which is my favorite plane. And I got it for a very nominal price. I think I got it for $25 at an auction. <clears throat> Didn't have a, have a, intact tote. I said, no problem. I'll make one of those <clears throat> and look pretty good. So I started to work on it. I had taken some of the rust off of it. I working on the tote and I had been working on a piece of furniture and I had let some shellac fall on my bench un unbeknownst to me. And I had taken the plane and I put the plane on its side. Next day I came down and I went to pull the plane up and, I, and it wouldn't come up. I said, what the hell is this? And I looked down and I said, oh, it's shellac. And I just pulled on it a little bit and it still wouldn't come up. And I was like, and I, I tapped a little on this side and it still wouldn't come up. So I, I got a stick, a wedge, and I thought that, you know, piece of wood, put a little uh, bevel on it and tapping it with a hammer and pull it, pop. And what happened? This whole piece here, if you come up close, cracked right off of the plane. What the hell is that? So I'm looking and I notice that the sides of the plane relative to the other three, four and a half I own was much thinner. So I said, let me take out my dial calipers. And I started measuring and there was huge differences amongst all four planes. From the best plane that I own, the highest quality, to this being the lowest quality. So what I started doing was, when I go to these shows and such looking for tools, I bring a set of dial calipers as well, because you never know what that casting is gonna be in terms of quality. And what I do is, is I try to get the best plane that I have, and I use that as a standard, and I have so much of a deviation in my mind that I'm willing to accept. But you really want to check that out because this plane that I thought was a really great plane really had an inferior casting. I mean, there's no way that a plane, you're pulling it off of just dried shellac, should crack like that, but it cracked so easily. I was really, really stunned and disappointed. <clears throat> okay, let's talk a little bit about um, refurbishing the totes. What I generally do with a tote like this is, you never know what the finish is. I mean, in the old days, they could use linseed oil, they could use some kind of a varnish, 
They could use a lacquer. They could use just wax, shellac. You never know what you're going to get. So the first thing I do is I always take out my little alcohol and I rub it to see if it's shellac, the alcohol will emulsify the shellac. It'll take off the finish. That doesn't work. Then I know it's some other kind of a finish that's going to re require a much more stringent, you know, you know, uh, refinishing component. And what I'll do is, is I'll, I'll soak it in something for a short period of time, put on gloves, and then I'll rub very gently at first with uh, steel wool. And as I'm rubbing and it starts to come off, I'll know that that's what's going to work. I'll take it out, put it on a blanket, and then I'll rub it all off with the steel wool. Once I get the finish off, then I'll clean it with mineral spirits. Now I have a nice, clean surface. What I like to do on my planes, uh, the one that Merle actually won, first I'll use an oil, and I will, I'll, of course, sand it. And then once it's sand nice and smooth, I usually sand up to about between six and 800, depending on the, on the quality of the wood. With rosewood, at 600, you're burnishing the wood. You almost don't need to put anything on it other than wax. It's amazing how polished that gets. And here's a piece of, of rosewood that I, the kind of rosewood that I get from uh, Cook Woods out in Oregon. Real high quality woods, very dense, and it polishes amazing. I mean, this is just off of a saw, and it looks like it's been sanded smooth. And then, so, so once I have that, uh, that tote all out and, and sanded properly, then I will use, I like to use tongue oil. And I'll put a coat of tongue oil on, I'll rub it, soak it really good, wait a couple of hours, come back, wipe it off, let it dry overnight. If it looks like it's really impregnated well, then I may go to the shellac. If it's not, I put another coat on, let it dry. Once it's all dry, then I will buff it again with, with, uh, with steel wool just to kind of blend any of that existing oil back in. And even if it's a slight bit wet, not wet to the touch, but you can see it's still weeping, you can seal that with shellac. And I didn't know that. And, the, and how I found out that that works was I'm fortunate enough to live in an area in Canterbury where I'm surrounded by talent. I got David Lamb up the block. I got Tom McLaughlin to the left of me. And I got Claude a little bit past Tom. So, I mean, I got it all covered. There's no question I can't ask. There's nothing about turning, fine furniture making, finishing. I got three of the most talented guys in the country within five seconds of me. And I became very friendly with Tom. And I used to go over there and spend a lot of time with him working on pieces and so one day we were making this table. Actually, it was for one of the shows that he did when he used to be on uh, Rough Cut with Tommy Mack. Now it's Tommy McGoffin. And he was making this big kitchen table. So he goes, Mike, today we're going to oil the table and I'm going to finish it. I said, we're going to do that one day, Tommy? goes, yeah. So he takes out mineral spirits and he goes, let's rub it on. You take that end, I'll take it on. Rub it on the mineral spirits. Soaked it really good. We waited an hour or two. Come back, wiped it off. How's it look? Any dry spots? He had a couple of here. So put a little more on Mike. Put a little more. Put some on his side. Rubbed it. Okay. Buffed it in. We waited another about an hour or two. Okay. Uh, carry it downstairs. We're gonna. I'm bringing it to the spray booth. I said, Tom, it, it hasn't even dried three, four hours. He goes, Mike, it's fine. First, I'm saying to myself, does this guy know what the hell he's doing? And then I'm saying to myself, he's a furniture master. Sure, he knows what the hell he's doing. You don't know what you're doing. I said, okay. So we lifted up the top, brought it downstairs, wiped it down again with a clean cloth, and he proceeds to spray a shellac finish on it. And Tom is an excellent sprayer, by the way. If you ever want something sprayed professionally, David Lamb sends his stuff to Tom to spray. That's how good Tom is. Don't tell David I said that. So he sprays the whole top, dries in, you know, 20 minutes. We wait another hour. He says, okay, there's some nibs. He rubs it down with some very fine steel wool and a little oil. Wipes it again. Sprays it again. Top was glass smooth. 
I couldn't wait to come the next day. I said, ah, that, I, I'm going to come back there. It's going to be a mess. It, it was gorgeous. So what I found was you can seal shellac. You can seal with shellac a lot faster than I thought you could. And it makes for a remarkable finish. And the reason you can seal with shellac, which I didn't know, is shellac breathes, where a lot of other film finishes do not. So you can seal if there's any more oil that needs to kind of off gas or needs some kind of oxygen. It actually goes through the shellac, but it doesn't damage the finish. So what I do, what I did on, on Merle's plane was, actually it was beach and it had some stains in it. So I used uh, what's called oxalic acid. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Oxalic acid is wood bleach. And you make a solution in, in warm water. You put it on the... Whenever you're using it, let me say this. Whenever you're using it, you have to do the whole piece. If you just do one spot, that spot will be nicely bleached, and the rest will look like crap. So you do not want to only bleach one spot. You have to bleach the whole spot. Now, if, if one spot requires a little more, you can put more in that one area that may be impregnated with mold or some other kind of you know, encrusted dirt or something. But you have to do the whole entire piece when you bleach. So I actually soaked the toad in there because it had two or three, look, look, looked almost like a mold, but it may have been stained from like some kind of a metal, being next to a metal that was wet or such. It bleached it nicely. There's no stains that you can see on that handle, is there, Merle? It looks pretty, pretty clean? Okay. So soaked it in there, took everything out, let it dry uh, about half a day. I always set things up in front of a fan so that there's always movement and helps things to dry quicker. Then I, um, then I oiled it with tongue oil, uh, soaked it really good, waited an hour, wiped it off, soaked it one more time. I think I waited maybe two hours, wiped it off. And then at night when I came down, I buffed it out with a nice clean lint cloth. Then I sprayed it with spray shellac. Right, yes. This stuff's great. And once you get your spray technique down, you can put a coat on. You almost don't need to do anything, which I can't do because I'm kind of OCD when it comes to finishing. <clears throat> so I sprayed this. I think I sprayed two, three coats. And the third coat, then I used uh, steel wool. And after I used the steel wool, I... But I buff everything out that I make, whether it's furniture, whether it's tools, whether it's jigs, anything that I put a finish on, I always buff out with steel wool. And I use four odd steel wool. And I've been using lately a steel wool that Brie Wax makes because it's oil free. It's a real good quality steel wool. It's very fine and it doesn't leave some of those fine little bristles that you see sometimes in some of the other steel wool. And the reason that's important is if you ever use any water-based finishes and some of those little things break off that you don't see and you put it on with, and then later on you use the wax, you'll actually find like little rust spots. And you'll say, where'd those come from? It came from those tiny, tiny little pieces of steel wool that got impregnated that you didn't see because you didn't dust off properly or you didn't use a tack cloth or blow it off with a compressor. And then the water base will actually cause it to rust. So... If you're doing something that's a really high-end piece, what you want to use is oil-free steel wool. And Brie Wax is, makes a really good product. It's not cheap, though, but it's a, it's a quality product. Yes, sir. Okay, so you just tell me about the uh, using the uh, bleaching. Yes. Oh, with some of the bleaching, uh, I know I bleached a floor one time because I had, a, you know, I had to, but I, and I did just exactly what you said, did the whole floor. But I had to use a neutralizer with that. I don't know if that one, because there was peroxide and everything that you mixed with it. I was just wondering, with that particular bleach that you're using, do you have to use anything to uh, neutralize it after? Generally, I will, I will, I will uh, wash it off with warm water. Thank you for mentioning that, and I, that is a step. Once I do bleach it, I will wash it off with warm water and a, and a, and a light scrubby pad, not a, uh, not a real heavy-duty one that's going to scratch it. Thank you. 
So then I put, I put three coats of the shellac on, and then I buffed it with um, the steel wool and some wax. And you can ask Merle. I mean, the handle has a beautiful, soft feel and patina to it, which makes it really enjoyable to, to use. You know, when you want to pick up a tool, when it feels nice. Thank you for caressing that for me, uh, Merle. <laughs> when, it, when a tool feels... I know. <laughs> when, a, when a tool feels nice, it's not only beautiful to look at, but it really kind of, kind of motivates you to want to use it because it, it feels good. You just, I mean, there are times I go downstairs and just kind of touch my tools just because <laughs> you need to delete that from the tape Be, because it, cause it feels, just feels so good, that silky smooth feel. And you get that by finishing something properly as opposed to just slapping on polyurethane or slapping them some kind of a finish and you, you're not not buffing it out you know when you when for tools when you give it that little bit of an extra step in terms of uh making that finish finer and more user friendly it, it really i feel it really enhances enhances the usage any, any questions on any of that yes sir on the, vinegar, on the vinegar solution, uh, is there any time limit? Is say you could you leave it in there for two days? I'll tell you what. That's a very good question. One day I did that. When it came back, it was a lot grayer. So that's why I I had made uh, the statement earlier. Once I go in there and I start to rub with the steel wool and I see that all of the uh, rust is starting to emulsify, then I know it's good, and I'll take it out of the solution just using my steel wool and a glove and, and the existing vinegar, and I'll clean it off until it's smooth. That's what, that's what I did with the, um, with the compass plane. What the hell? Oh, here it is. And all, all of the rust is basically off. There's no more rust. Now, there is some pitting, and I'm going to address that probably with some very, very fine sandpaper and oil um, just to give it a little more smooth texture. Yes, sir. Yeah, the white vinegar you get at the grocery store? Yes, but try to get distilled because the, the reason I say distilled is I read some articles on that and distilled seems to have a little more of a refinement to it. It has less, uh, I guess, elements in it. My friend here, the chemist, would I be correct in saying that? Oh, the question was um, distilled vinegar versus regular vinegar. Does distilled have less heavy elements in it that, okay, so that would impede maybe the, okay, that's why I used it. Yes, sir. If you have to flatten the plane, how are you doing that? Okay, good question. As I said before, like on this plane, I, I brought my square and I brought a, uh, a straight edge, a starret, and it was almost dead flat. But every once in a while, I'll find a plane that I really like that's not so flat. How do you flatten them? What I do usually is I, I got myself a granite block because a granite block is probably the flattest uh, thing that you can use for flattening because they're usually like within a thousandth of an inch uh, in terms of their flat, flatness overall. You can, always, you can also use a phenolic plate. Se several of the... Uh, woodworking corporations sell what's called phenolic plates. They're like uh, four inches wide by maybe 12 to 16 inches long. And they're also dead flat. And you can adhere sandpaper. Sometimes I use a spray with very thin sandpaper. Sometimes all you have to do is wet it and the, the, the wetting action will actually suck the paper down so it doesn't move. But a lot of times I have to spray um, you can use float glass. That's also very, very flat. Or if you're broke, like many of us at certain parts in our life, you can go to Home Depot and get a, and get a granite uh, floor tile and use that. Is that going to be within a thousandth of an inch? Probably not, but it's not bad. So you can use that as, a, as an option. I'll start out with 60 grit. I usually use uh, WD-40 because it's cheap. And it's pretty good for 
uh, you know, flattening purposes. Sorry, Peter. Uh, and then I'll go, then I'll go to 60. I'll go to 80, 120, 150, 220. I usually don't go past 220. Um, and the reason for that is if you make it too slick, you'll find that your plane will almost like start to adhere to any woods that are a little bit wet. That, you know, it's just so, so flat and so shiny. And so 220 is usually fine. Sometimes I also use my good friend's polishing compound on a big piece of leather when I want to give it a nice, flat, shiny patina, and it works fabulous. And if you didn't buy any, you're out of your minds because it's really good stuff, and he's selling it for a, a fraction of what it costs in, to buy it. Diamond slurry paste. It's right over there. Earl will show you. Raise your hand, Earl, so they can see. If you want to know anything about any kind of buffing compound or anything like that, he's the man amongst his other talents. So that's how I flatten the bottom. Again, everyone doesn't want to spend their weekend flattening a plane. So you have to say to yourself, what, what are my limits? Like, what, what am I looking for? What you're really looking for is you want to get the, the space in front of the blade as flat as possible. And if you can get both sides fairly flat on the edges, you don't have to worry about this whole hollow because now you have a flat front and you have the reference parts on the side. You basically have a flat structure. And that's more than sufficient. And now you can go watch the football game and you know, you're not downstairs for three days because some, the, some of these planes are really, really out of flat. You can spend a hell of a lot of time. I was talking with Peter one time. I said, we should invent the machine that can flatten planes. And of course, Peter says, there is a machine that can flatten planes. But John Siegel has it. Right? Your machine doesn't do that, right? No. But John's can, right? Yes, sir. Stan? When you're doing the flattening, do you want the, the iron and the cap and everything? Installed? Everything has to be together. And the reason, for, that's a great question. The reason for that is, is if this isn't under tension and you're flattening this when it's not under tension, believe it or not, you can torque this plane just enough so that you're not flattening it in the same plane that it would be had the cap iron and the, and the cutting iron been in there. And I didn't know that. When I first started doing this, I used to just take everything off and put a rag around it. Then I read a, a very interesting article, and then I went through this website that I use, and everyone kind of substantiated it. You have to have all the components together when you flatten the plane. Great question, Stan. So let's talk a little bit about the internal mechanism, okay? First thing you want to make sure is that your cap iron isn't chipped, that it fits on snugly. When you remove your blade, and I buy a lot of planes on eBay because I get great deals, and I, plus I stay up all night, and when no, not, no other normal people are up, so I can, I can bid when everyone else is asleep, so it's great. That's, that's the truth. Um, when you'll see a plane like on eBay, let's say, for instance, here it is sitting here, and you'll, you can't see, I mean, they give you pictures, but you can't see all that much. The first thing I always look for is, is the tote and the knob intact? Does it look good? You got to look really, really, really well because some of these re repairs, like I said, most of the guys are reputable and they'll say to you, this is a repaired tote. You look, you can't see it, but I don't want that. I, I, want, a, I want a solid tote. Um, if you use PayPal, though, like I do, if you're not happy, you get your money back. So I'm never worried about purchasing something because I know I'm not going to get screwed. Um, so those are, those are the first two things I look at. Do I have good totes? The second thing is, is I, want a, I want a fairly good-sized blade because to replace these blades with an original is not cheap. I mean, these Stanley blades can run any, anywhere from $25 to $40 because they know that you just can't go out and buy an old Stanley blade. So people that collect 
tons and tons of blades and have and have these blades available charge you you know premium price so I always look and the way you can tell is you look at the height here's the chip breaker you'll see blades sometimes where the where the chip breaker <clears throat> is only uh, three quarters of an inch to an inch below the top of the blade so you're gonna know then that there's not a lot left on that blade that's something I learned the hard way because I bought a bunch of chips. You can see here, once you start getting to about here, you don't have any, any appreciable uh, amount of blade left. Plus, this blade probably isn't hardened all that well close to this area. The hardening probably stops around here. They don't harden the entire blade. You, you think they do, but they don't. So... You want the longest blade that you can get so that you know that you're going to have a lot of sharpenings left on that blade. The next thing is the frog. Take out the screws. Um, what you want to do with the frog is I usually take out the screws. I usually take off the adjustment knob. I really like the wider knobs like this. It's much easier to use. Is that good, Gary? Okay. The wider knobs like this are easier to use. And you know, as we get older, it's tougher to turn these things. And I'd much rather have something nice and big that I can, that I can spin easily than some like, like this knob is really tiny. It's a pain in the neck to turn. And I, I like brass as opposed to steel. So I usually take off the anvil. The anvil is this... is this little piece here, for you people that may not know, that allows the plain blade to rotate up and down. I'll take that off, it's just a pin in there, just tap that out. I'll clean that up, I'll clean up the uh, adjustment knob. Do I have one that I cleaned? On, on Earl, yes sir. The oak, yeah. On, on Merle's plane, I cleaned that adjustment knob with just a brass brush on a, on a, on a grinder. And it, it cleans up, you know, really nice. And then I use brass polish to enhance it a little bit. But they, they clean up very, very nice. And then <clears throat> I'll take out the frog. And what I do with the frog is once I clean it well and oil it, I'll put it on a... Um, on my granite plate with maybe uh, 150 paper, and I'll run it back and forth for maybe five or 10 minutes until the bottom of the frog is nice and shiny and dead flat. You want that to be seated, because that makes a huge difference if it's not seating properly in terms of maintaining the integrity of the blade against that frog. So you want to you want to take that and rub it against the granite plate so it seats nicely. Um, now, let me talk a little bit about Japanning. Does everyone know what that is? Yes, Japanning. Has anybody heard that term? You do. You know everything. You're a smart guy. <laughs> now, a lot of times when people refurbish planes, they'll take a plane <clears throat> like this, and the Japanning is the black, looks almost like paint, that they use to seal uh, the bottom of the planes and some of the aspects of the artifacts of the planes. Now that Japanning is not paint. It's a combination of, I think, asphalt with some paint components and some other things. And it's baked on, it's not sprayed on. They put it on and then they have to bake it. That's the, the correct historical way to replace the Japanning on a plane. Most people that I've seen take the plane, go to Home Depot, get rust oleum and go, oh, refurbished. Does it look nice? Looks okay, but that's not the historical way to do it. If you want to do it correctly, there are websites that will give you the formula for how to do the Japanning. Most of the times I don't redo the Japanning because it's, it's expensive and tedious to do that. And who wants that smell? 
I did it one time downstairs in my basement. And I thought my wife was going to throw me and my tools out the window because it stunk. <clears throat> so unless you have like a garage or something where you can do that, it's a, kind of a smelly operation. So I just leave it. I will wire brush with a hand wire brush and oil, clean it up really nicely. And it, it still has a decent patina. It's a nice patina. But it doesn't have that phony look of being sprayed with Krylon, which I, I personally don't care for. Now, blade sharpening. <clears throat> I'm a big believer that you want the blade to be as sharp as possible, but you have to have reasonable limits. What do I, what do I mean by that? I've watched all kinds of videos of, about sharpening because I think it's an extraordinarily valuable skill. And there are people that are there and they have uh, their 10,000 grit stones and their 20,000 grit stones and their 50,000 grit stones. And I, I guess you could sharpen until the cows come home, but what, for what purpose? You have to say to yourself, is it sharp enough for me to do quality work? Because as soon as you take that plane and you put it to wood, that 50,000 grit stone sharpening is gone. And, and, and then we forget that sometimes. You know, we, we get so obsessed with sharpening at the, the highest possible grit that we think like, you know, because we sharpen to a 20,000 grit that it's going to stay sharp like that forever. The first pass, you're done. You're probably at 5,000 grit. So you have to say to yourself, what's reasonable to do? What I do is I use a combination of things. I'm a big proponent of the Tormek. Why? Because I don't want to spend all day sharpening. I mean, I'd rather be upstairs watching boxing, to be honest with you. I don't want to spend my entire day on a stone, back and forth. Back. That makes me nuts. Will I do it? If I have a real good quality tool? Absolutely. But I don't want to do that. So I bought the Tormek because when I saw it demonstrated, I said, wow, this puts a really beautiful bevel on a tool. These are a set of old Stanley planes that I purchased a while ago, maybe almost a year. All I did was sharpen them and clean them just with mineral spirits. I don't know how well you can see the blade on this. That's the, that's the bevel that you get right off of the Tormek. That's not buff, that's not no other stone. That's just from the Tormek. This is the black of the blade from the Tormek on the leather wheel. This thing is like razor sharp. I can shave the hairs off my arm, I can cut paper with it. It's a fabulous tool to use. I like to, I like to refurbish tools that, I, that I'm gonna use as well as look at. So when you're using the Tormek, you're going to, yes, sir. Oh, you're just stretching or? What do you think of the workshop? The workshop is okay, except for the fact that the workshop goes around. So now you got to think of what's going on in terms of the uh, dynamics of the steel being cut in a swirl. The strength of steel um, is mitigated by what we're doing to it in what direction. When you start to go transverse or in a horizontal pattern or whatever, you're changing the geometry of that steel. Is it a huge difference? I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, an engineer. I don't know. But I suspect once you take it out of that vertical way, I mean, if, 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 if that wasn't the case, then everybody would just be sharpening sideways. Now, some people do hone the back of the plane sideways, but it's interesting. You don't see them honing the front of the plane sideways because you want that verticality to maintain the integrity of the direction of the steel. Um, that's the only reason why I would, I would have a, a, an issue about the workshop. Probably puts a nice edge on. I know they have those glass plates with different kinds of uh, paper on them. I'm sure it puts a beautiful edge, but I, I, like, the, I like the verticality of the, of the steel. Is the cost a lot different? Yes, the, the Tormek is, they're out of their minds, but it's a great machine. It's uh, about seven or eight hundred dollars, and if you get, I don't think they're out of their mind, but I mean it's a well-designed machine, and you're paying for what you. 
you know, you get a seven-year guarantee. I mean, it's a lot of money. I mean, it's a motor with, with a wheel on it. I mean, now granted, it's calibrated very well. There's like very little run out, but it's, it's a lot. I mean, $800 for a machine, and that's without hardly any attachments. If you get all of the attachment, what is it, like $1,200? It's like going from a uh, general age. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Bill. Yes. I, I recently, there was a guy actually, and I want to talk to you about him. His name was Jeff Ames. How many people here know Jeff Ames besides Peter? Oh, good. Jeff Ames was an accomplished period furniture maker and a wonderful man. And I got to meet him a couple of months ago and he was selling a bunch of stuff, actually a Stanley four and a half. And I saw it and I immediately called him up and said, got to have it. Don't sell it. I'll, I'm right, I'll be right over. And we just sat down and talked for hours and hours and hours. He's just a really interesting, intelligent guy, friendly. He just recently moved to New Mexico. And he, um, he sold me his four and a half with a, with a Ron Hawk blade to it. So I brought that home, sharpened the blade. And I had sharpened my other four and a half, which had a really good Stanley blade. A world of difference. Even in rough woods, no chatter, uh, minimal tear out on, on, on very uh, figured woods. I mean, amazing. Ron Hawk's blades are phenomenal. Anytime you can replace whatever that blade is with a Ron, other than Lee Nielsen, with a Ron Hawk blade, it's a great, great, great blade. So I, I, I do think very favorably of those. That particular blade is terrific. Makes a big difference in any plane that you're going to use, other than a high end like a Lee Nielsen or a Clifton or a Veritas or, you know. But any of the Stanleys that you replace with Ron Hawk, world of difference. Yes, sir. Do you run into the problem with the mouth opening on the older planes that don't have mouth adjustments to have a bigger plane in a very yeah, you, yeah, you gotta file them. If you don't have the clearance, you gotta take a fine file and you gotta open it up a little more. Yeah. But to me it's worth it because those blades are fantastic. It's not difficult to do that. It really no. That's right. That's right. Um, so, any other questions about planes at all? Sharpening? Yes, sir. The frog, yes. It's not on. There it is. Hello. Hello. Um, you mentioned you took it off, but yeah. you didn't mention how to adjust it. Well, on some of the planes, there isn't a lot of adjustment. Usually on the frogs, that when you remove the screws, the screws will have a certain amount of mobility. On some of the other Stanleys, there's actually a screw in the back that can adjust the frog back and forth. I generally try to have the frog meet right at the bottom of the base. And, and the sole, and what I do is I put a, a thin straight edge on that to make sure that it's supported all the way. Because the more support that that blade has, the less opportunity for chatter. Sometimes people will move the frog back a little too far, and then the blade is kind of just resting on the sole and a little bit on the frog, and there's space. Not good. Yeah, that's why I asked the question, because I did have one the other day that there was space between the, before I took it apart, there was space between the frog, between the opening and the frog. Okay. So I slid it ahead and. And it made a big difference, I, right? Yeah. Great. Yes, sir. There's not a book, but oh, I wanted to mention this, and that's a very good question. There's a website that is amazing in terms of tuning up planes, parts for planes. I was going to print out a whole bunch of stuff, and I started, and I was, I was on page 60, I'm sorry, I was on page 67, and I said, if I make 100 copies of this, my print is going to melt. <laughs> so what I did was I copied the websites down at home. So anybody that's interested in any of this information, let me know, because I, I took a whole bunch of the websites on plane refurbishment, sharpening blades, 
sharpening saws, a whole bunch of stuff, furniture refinishing, all the topics that we're kind of talking about here. And I'll send you all those links because that's much easier and then you guys can copy them yourself. I don't have it in my head. I'm not that smart. Ow, I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. He's from a different part of Staten Island. I, I can do that too. I can do that too. Sure. My pleasure. <clears throat> so that's planes. Anything else I want to say about planes? No. Any other questions about planes at all? I mean, if you have a lot of money, you want to buy a Lee Nielsen plane. They're fabulous planes. Can't say enough about them. Veritas, also fabulous planes. They're accurate. They have great blades. They're thick. They're terrific. But, you know, you have to be willing to pay three or $400. You can go get a Stanley if you shop for 40 or $50 and put some work into it and throw a Ron Hawk blade and for $125, you have something that's not a Lee Nielsen, but it's not bad. Pretty close. Yes, sir. Woodcrafts are all right. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that they're not good plays. They're, they're okay. Yeah, yes. Oh. They're okay. Yes. Yeah, the adjustment, yeah, the adjustment screw on the to uh, move the blade up and down the frog. Um, they get a they get some play in the uh, in the threads, and you have to turn the screw a little bit further, or sometimes a lot further, to get the thing to move. Uh, what do you recommend for that? Well, yeah, if you get a lot of play like that, then then maybe w what you need to do is either get a new screw or a new adjustment knob so that you don't have all that backlash. It shouldn't. Go ahead. What he what he said. Go ahead. Go ahead. Give give him the. So you can get. Jeez. Hello. <laughs> uh, you can get play uh, in the ba in the yoke of the plane. You know what I'm saying? From where it's a, you know these planes have really been you know banged around, used extensively, and uh, the materials aren't the materials that going into a Lee Valley or a Lee Nielsen plane today. So you can look around for another plane uh, and maybe get another yoke that's similar and fix it up that way, or you can just you know live with the backlash. It's not that bad. You just take it out. Every time you advance it, bring it back, you just take it and you bring, you know, turn the screw so it takes it out. And you're fine. It'll work. You know? All right. Any, any other questions about planes at all? And any questions that you can think of later on? I mean, yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to add, in, in regards to, you know, the play and the slop and the yoke, I, I see a lot of tooling, and it seems to be it seems to be the a lot of people say, well, it's for woodworking, and they don't want to use any oil or any grease on the tool. But there is a place for that. And a little grease on the yoke, a little grease on the thread. It's, it's not going to ruin your woodwork. You know, you don't slather it, but the tool will last many lifetimes longer. That's correct. But you know, I, I get tools where I have to make parts because people just wore it out because it was dry. The other thing is, is that, you know, th there are dry lubricants out there that are pretty good. There's a bicycle lubricant that dries dry. That works pretty effectively. Um, my good friend Peter pointed that out to me. And I actually used that on my saw stop because I was having trouble uh, raising and lowering the blade at a certain point. Once I cleaned out all the threads and I sprayed it with that, let it dry overnight. The next day, it whipped up and down like nothing. So the dry lubricants are very effective and if you're worried about contamination or you're worried about it dripping that's another good alternative but the gentleman's absolutely correct you got to keep your stuff lubricated I mean if I leave any of my planes for any period of time I spray the whole things down with jojoba oil or camella oil and let them just sit there and then when I'm ready to use them I wipe them down if you watch the Japanese when they would work this is what they do they'll take their knife or whatever they'll use their knife they wipe it down with a rag with, with uh, camellia oil or, or jojoba oil. It's almost clear. 
very, very fine. And they use it constantly. If you've ever watched any of, uh, of uh, Paul Sellers' videos, anyone know who Paul Sellers is? Okay. Fantastic. Paul makes a, uh, an oiling can where he, yeah. He, yeah, he makes an oiling can where he takes this material, like a linen material that he wraps very, very tight. He puts it in an old, like a uh, soup can or something with maybe an inch or so extended, and then he saturates the uh, material with, with oil, a fine oil. He lets it sit there and dry, and then when, when he takes his planes, he's gonna use them, he flips them over first, he takes that, that can with the thing and he just rubs it once or twice, and then he proceeds to plane, and it's great. Nice, smooth finish, it, he reduces uh, uh, friction. Yes, sir? I, I have to add, don't use motor. No, 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 right, no, no. The, the, no, the, the two I use are Jojoba oil that you can get at Lee Nielsen for a fortune, uh, but it's good. And this is actually camellia oil from Japan that I like even more. It's, it's actually even, even finer when you, than, than, the, uh, than the jojoba. Did you? Yeah. yeah, because the other one gels up, and if it's in cold water, it's all gelled up. What's the one in your left hand there? This is, this is Camellia. C Camellia, C-A-M-E-L-L-I-A, -L -L -I Camellia oil. Camellia. And this is Jojoba, J-O-J-O-B-A. Jojoba. Jojoba, thank you, sir. For us Italians, we go Jojoba. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Have you ever used the oil like uh, also sells the car does? Have I used that? Yes, that's Only on a rig. I haven't made that can thing yet, but I'd like to do that. He, he's he he made a uh, an oiling mechanism where he yeah where he puts these linen things in a can and then he oils them and then he just uses them. You know, you can also use paraffin, which I use all the time, which is fabulous. I mean, well, beeswax is okay, but beeswax tends to get a little sticky in warm weather where paraffin doesn't. That's why I like to use the paraffin on the, on the bottom of my planes and chisels sometimes too. It, it's, it's amazing how much easier it makes you work. We were at Sunapee in the way. Go ahead. I tried mutton. Pardon me? Mutton. Mutton's great, but it stinks. Mutton's great. In fact, there was a guy at, uh, at Sunapee that had, had, had using it, that, that uh, carpenter. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, you mean from the question wise? You have to repeat the question. Okay. The, the question we, we were addressing was about, about the kinds of oils that you can use to oil the planes. And I use I, the two things I, hel I held up. Then we talked a little bit about Paul Sellers makes a can that he puts oil in, pregnates, and he uses on the bottom. I said some other alternatives are paraffin, which I use all the time. Another gentleman suggested uh, beeswax, which is okay, except if it gets warm, it can get sticky. Um, what I like to use sometimes is canuba wax. And if you guys want to come up here later, this stuff is so hard. It's almost like ceramic. It's incredibly hard wax, but it's fantastic. It puts an amazing finish. You can actually use this on the lathe. You can burnish this right against your piece, and, and that's your finish. It's terrific, but it's really, really hard. Okay, um, let me see. I'm going to go through some stuff fast. Incidentally, I want people to come up here and touch this stuff. It's never fun to just listen to somebody talk and not touch the tools, especially the Bridge City tools, because I think they're works of art. And it'll give me the opportunity to go home and polish them again, which I really like. <laughs> okay. Let's talk a little bit about chisels. I love the old Stanley, Stanley Everlast chisels because they're incredibly durable. The steel is amazing. 
It's fairly hard. It's probably a Rockwell 57, 58, which is pretty hard. It sharpens easily. But they're workhorses. They have a metal tang that goes right through the handle to the back. So you can use them for fine finishing. You can bang the hell out of them. You'll never, never, never damage this plane's body. You may mess up the blade a little bit, but unbelievable. And they're a set like this now, I just saw on eBay, went for almost $800. I couldn't believe it. Um, the most expensive ones are the... Uh, the bigger planes, the one and a quarter, the one and a half, and the two inch, they're hard to come by. I actually have a bid now on eBay for a two inch one. What Stanley is that? What was the second name? Stanley Everlast, E V E R L A S T. If you ever can get your hands on those, you want to. Now, let me talk a little bit about planes. First thing, chisels, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> The first thing, yeah, I know, it's tough when you get old. The first thing you always want to make sure is, is that there is no pitting whatsoever towards the edge of the blade, towards the part you're going to sharpen. I don't care how much pitting there is back here. I'm probably not going to be alive by the time I get to this part to sharpen. So it doesn't make any difference to me. Does it look terrible? Yes. Aesthetically, it's ugly. But in terms of the quality of the tool, it makes no difference whatsoever. However, if you don't, if you do have pitting here at the edge and you try to sharpen it, you're never going to get a really, really fine edge that can, you can do any fine woodworking if there's a lot of pitting. So you always want to avoid that. The other thing is you have to say to yourself, what, what can I do and what do I like to do? I love to make handles for furniture, uh, for tools. I love to make handles. So it makes no difference to me whatsoever what shape the handle is. In fact, I'd rather buy a tool that had no handle cheaper than one that had what they thought was a beautiful handle. But if you don't like to make handles, then you really have to take a close look at the handle. Is it chipped? What, what kind of wood is the handle made out of? Can that chip be repaired? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to do mortising? Are you going to do paring? Are you going to do fine woodworking? Are you going to do any kind of heavy carpentry where you're going to be banging that plane? You have to make a determination. How am I going to use the plane? And that kind of judges, gives you a judgment as to, you know, the condition of the handle and what you're willing to do with the handle. So these planes are fabulous because they have, they're made out of uh, red oak, extremely dense. You rarely see them. I mean, every one of these planes is over a hundred years old. And this is, this is the worst that you'll see on the plane is a slight, slight check. How's that? He wanted everyone to see it. The handle. It's not focused. You're fired. You're fired. Okay. Now, what I'll do with that is probably one of two things. I'll either put in a colored wax that I melt um, that's in here, wax sticks, and I use a, uh, I use a uh, alcohol torch with a little palette knife, and I melt that in. Or I've also started to use, uh, Mohawk makes these uh, proprietary epoxy putties. They're called Tootsie Roll sticks. They look like Tootsie Rolls. And you knead them up. They come in a gazillion different colors. And I'll put that in there. And then you can sand it. And whatever finish you want, oil or whatever. Uh, usually on these I use lacquer um, because um, I don't want them to be have a problem with any kind of moisture because I'm usually using them in an environment sometimes where there's moisture. But also when you use epoxy, when you put an oil finish over it, it doesn't look as good. With the, with the lacquer, you can, you can tint it to the color of the wood and the color of the epoxy, and it kind of all blends in. The great thing about epoxy is, is it doesn't move. So when you fill it, 
it stays that way. It doesn't shrink. Like, you know, some of the wood fillers will shrink, even the, the better ones like fama wood and such. There's always a little bit of shrinkage. Poxy just never shrinks. Stay solid. Yes, sir. There's a magazine called the Poxy Works, and it's on the West System, and it is fantastic. I, of course, I'm doing books, but it's the uses on it. You can look at the back, uh, the back issues on the website, but I subscribe. It comes from free, and what they'll do is it's just amazing. And Poxy Works. Poxy Works. West System. Yes, sir. Mohawk, M-O-H-A-W-K, Mohawk Finishing. They make, in my estimation, the best finishing products. I recently started a furniture restoration business, and I bought all my products from them. And the reason I did was because that's what Tom used. And I was amazed. They have toners. They have colored lacquers. They have all kinds of, uh, of uh, wax sticks. They have all kinds of blending powders. For any kind of color that you can imagine that you can mix it with shellac. I used to watch Tom, we, we, we do a piece and there'd be a problem with a particular area in the piece that didn't match properly. And I knew that, you know, he was always selling to very high end customers. I mean, his, his furniture making is exquisite. I said, Tom, what are you going to do with it? He goes, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to refinish that. I'm going to use some blending powders. And I'd be like, what are you kidding? You'll never get that to match in my head saying this. Uh, wrong. <laughs> he would take, he'd have a whole row of these blending powders. He'd take a little bit, a little bit, until he felt he had the right component color-wise. Then he would take shellac just on his finger, and he'd dab it in those, and he'd just dab it on the, on the piece. Rub it out with, dab a little more. He would get areas of wood that you'd never ever think that you could blend in to look perfect you could never tell you could go with a magnifying glass and you couldn't find where where the problem in the wood was that's how good he he was at it and when i used to watch him i was like oh that's the stuff i gotta get now i'm nowhere near as good as him but the product itself makes you good because it's so fine and because there's such a variety of colors and because it's it's reversible if you don't like it you put a little, you know, put a little acetone on you, you wipe it off, and you start all over again. It's terrific. You can't make a mistake. So blending pals, Mohawk, you want to go to their site, and then you want to go to Amazon. I don't know if you guys have Amazon Prime. I do. I buy tons of stuff from them. They have a lot of their products at very good prices, and it's free shipping if you have Prime, which is great. And it comes in two days. Okay. Um, so... In terms of chisels, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of, of, of makers out there. There's some from Germany called, I think it's Eskisluna. Eth, it's a German-made brand. Every once in a while, they come on eBay. They're fantastic. The steel is amazing. They're usually phenomenally expensive. But if you ever see them at auctions, I buy a lot of things at auctions because people like don't know what they have. They'll, they'll be like a box of crap, and they'll say, oh, give me $5. <sighs> That happened the other day, and at the box, at the bottom of that box was a Stanley 97 gauge, which is probably 25 bucks. So I was like, oh, thank you. Um, this was also at the bottom of a box, a uh, drill, drill, which is really nice with all the bits. So I was like, that's a find. And it was all rusted and everything. But all I did was clean it up. When I, when I clean anything, I only, only, only use a soft brass brush do not use a steel brush it will scratch even hard steel like i can i can take the bottom of a plane like this and use the brass brush on it and it'll clean it sufficiently uh to get most of the rust and grime off of it without any scratches whatsoever so you always want to use a, a fine the thickest you can find brass brush Okay, um, this was the Tootsie Roll uh, epoxy that I was telling you about. It comes in a stick like this. Let's see. Mohawk. M-O-H-A-W-K. There it is. Okay. Yes. They, they sell Mohawk. 
Huh? Woodcraft sells more Hulk probably. I just don't want to pay twice as much for it as we should. <laughs> Sorry, Mohawk. Um, this is the blending powder, also Mohawk. We'll get there. Very sensitive camera here, Gary. Let's back it up a little bit. How's that? I was thinking of doing something, but I figured it's taped, so I shouldn't do that on a tape. Yes, sir. Shellac. A little bit of shellac, and I dab it on. You could do it with oil. I mean, sometimes if I'm, I want a particular color, I'll mix some of the blending power in the oil that I'm using, like the tongue oil, mix it up, and then I'll rub it in. I'll burnish it in with, um, I'll burnish it in with uh, fine steel wool, let it set for a while, and then I'll buff it out with a pad. It's amazing the things that you can do to wood by using various combinations of oil and blending powers powders and waxes and it's just phenomenal. Yes, sir. Are you going to add that onto your uh, cheapest? Yes, I will, I will give you all of the information. I'll make a, a list of all of the sites and all the information that we're discussing here and then I'll ask my good friend Rip Van Winkle, my good friend Jim, to, uh, he's giving you a hard time, to, to post it on the website. Okay, we have a half an hour. Um, so in terms of the chisels, no pitting. Don't worry about the blade not being sharp. Some of the older chisels like Buck Brothers and uh, uh, Diamond and Weatherby, um, the steel on them is excellent. It's cast steel. It's not O1 steel. It's not A2 steel. It's not cryogenically treated but it sharpens up pretty easily and it has a really, really, really sharp edge that it keeps for a while. Does it keep it as long as a Lee Nielsen plane or no? But it's sharp and it's very functional and it's very easy to sharpen. Sometimes when I'm doing something, I don't wanna, I don't wanna spend another 20 minute sharpening it chisel. I want something I can sharpen in two seconds and I'll put it on my diamond stone and flatten the other side and, I, and I'm ready to go. And the, the steel on the, the quality of the steel is excellent. Just a regular type of steel that they used in the old days. It's just regular, you know, regular steel. It you know, wasn't, it's not treated like, a, you know, like we do now with all the different components. But it, it keeps a very, the older steels, you can sharpen to a very, very, very fine, sharp edge. It's amazing. And, and it's done easily, which is what I like. Is that your soft grass brush there? No. This is the brass brush. This is what I use when I'm refinishing. When I'm refinishing, uh, oh, we're in the I'm on the wrong thing here. Here we are. When I, any of the good tools, I'll use this. When it's something that's a hardened steel and I need to get inside, I'll use this stainless steel brush. I'll never use a brush that's not stainless or brass because if those things get in there and any kind of moisture that promotes rust I do not want to promote rust on my tools okay um, I'm gonna pass this tool around this was a tool that I bought recently for four dollars and the reason I bought it was I thought it was an excellent uh, example of a crappy finishing job so I wanted you guys to see it so you'll, so you'll know not what to do when you look at it. And then I'll discuss why it's crappy. You got fingerprints all over this, Tony. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> I can take a normal polish for you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll bet. 
I'm going to show you something. This is a little off the topic, but I thought this was very important. One of the things I use a lot is, are rasps. And I had purchased several of the rasps from uh, through Lee Nielsen, the Oreo rasps, that are fabulous. The only other rasp I've ever used that is as good is the Leo rasp from France. Also very high quality hand stitched rasps. There's a company that's come out with rasps now. Its name is Karate, C-O-R-R-A-D-I, Karate. They're from Portugal. And they make a rasp on a machine that mimics, mimics hand stitch rasps, but they're between $50 and $70 on eBay, and they're really good quality rasps. So if, you, if you're interested in ever purchasing a rasp and you don't want to spend $120 on, uh, on a... Uh, Lee Nielsen uh, rasp or Leoji from France rasp. Look at the karate rasp. They're really quality and, and they do really nice work. Another rasp that I recently found out about was a rasp that's made by uh, Tom Fiera, which is another Portuguese-based file and rasp maker. And they make a machine-based rasp with semi, uh, semi hand-stitched quality uh, uh, edges to it and they were originally going for seventy dollars and I was a little bit out apprehensive and the other day I'm late was late at night I'm on eBay and what do I see two Tom Ferrari rests for forty dollars and I couldn't get my bid down fast enough and because no one is nuts like me and stays up that late I, I, I got both rests <laughs> To, if you ever see these again, you put in Tome, T-O-M-E, and I think it's Ferrari, F-E-I-R-R-A. And it's a machine cut rasp, but in the hand-stitched pattern, and the, it does a really, really great job and leaves a fairly smooth finish. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, that's another good one. Yes, very good. They're, they're, they're not cheap, though. Yeah. Shinto. The question was that he said he uses Shinto rasp, which I believe is Japanese, uh, a Japanese rasp. It, it, it has like kind of a handle. Isn't it kind of some of them are rounded on the bottom? There's a bevel, or are they flat? Uh, They're flat. It almost looks like a cheese grater kind of a construction, and they have a very good reputation for being able to hog off a wood, a lot of wood, but leaving a fairly smooth finish. Shinto. There's a rough surface and a and a smooth surface, and I, I tell you, I'm, it's a tool I'm going to use the rest of my life. It's really great. And I was up at Wooden Boat School for two week course, and you saw them all over the place. So. Okay, um, I want to get in just a little bit into the refinishing. Again, I want to encourage you guys when we're when we're done just to come up and touch the tools and look at them because the Bridge City stuff is is amazing. Okay, a friend of mine posted some stuff on the website, <laughs> and I couldn't call fast enough and went up there and purchased it and it was the deal of a lifetime what these are worth versus what the guy charged me is almost a crime um, I brought this is because this was a mallet that I saw at an auction the guy wanted five bucks for it and first I was gonna pass it up and I picked it up and I said hmm very heavy and leave them by and I Took out my pocket knife and I turned around and I went like this and I go, ooh, lignum vita. I said, I'll take it. This is a lignum vita mallet. For those of you who don't know what lignum vita is, it's the most dense wood that we have. It's incredibly dense and hard. Yes, sir. I have a lot of them. It's about uh, maybe that big around, five feet long. I can't pick it up. What, what's your address again, Earl? <laughs> <laughs> It's unbelievable. Um, I have four of these. And how did I get them? When I go to these auctions, 
You'll see a whole box sometimes with mallets or an old mallet. If you can, if you get familiar with what the wood looks like, it always has this kind of a chocolate with vanilla kind of a patina to it. Sometimes they're all all vanilla, but a lot of times you'll see some of these veins of the chocolate. And you get familiar, you definitely want this mallet. I mean, they're worth a fortune and they're fabulous. They never split. Yes, sir. That's right. And bearing in submarines and boats. My father-in-law, who was a shipmaker, he was the first one that ever told me about this because he had a mallet. I said, Pop, why is this so heavy? He goes, oh, that's lignum vita. Like, I knew what the hell that was. I said, what is that? So he explained it to me. He says, you know, they use that in the bearings on boats because his dad was a boat builder. And they, they would take these two huge pieces and chuck them on the sides. And I'd love to go to some of those boats and get those, like get those bearings. Do they still use Yeah. Unbelievable wood. So... If, if you, you didn't hear that, he said a hydro, he was saying that hydroelectric systems use that too as, as for bearings, the lignum vitae, this kind of a wood, because it's, it's impregnated with like a lot of resin and it's very hard. So it makes a very good, like a bearing, a bushing kind of. Can you scratch it with your finger or is it that hard? No. So how tough is it to machine? Uh, you have to have very sharp tools, and you got to sharpen them a lot. But this, after I turned it, it was all a mess. I just turned it to get all the crap off of it. All I did with this was put sandpaper on it. There's no finish, and it's and it's like glass smooth. Wow. Really? Pardon me? I scratched the little off so I could see what the what kind of wood it was. I knew it was it was some kind of a heavy hardwood. It was either. Certainly, go ahead. It's either some kind of a rosewood or a lignum vitae or, you know, I always like when it's exotic wood. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it just for the wood. For, for five bucks or whatever it was. Um, what else? Are oh, in terms of shining metal, you ever see that stuff, uh, symethicone or symethicone that you see on the websites for metal? Simichrome, yeah. This is the same stuff, top right. I got 12 of these for $50 at the Big E last year and does a great job of polishing. So if that guy's back there and he's selling them again, I made him a deal like he wanted five or six bucks. I said, how much if I buy 12? He goes, $50. I said, thank you. I got 12, 50 bucks. Um, this is the spray shellac I was, I was telling you about. Really good. Once you get your technique down, you can put a really nice finish. It dries almost instantaneously. Put a lot of coats on in a day. <clears throat> and then the last coat, you want to buff. Yes, sir. Of the shellac, Zinser. Zinser. Z-I-N. That looks, that, that, that particular one has has a uh, waxing. Yes, it. yes, it's not it's not the blonde. No, it doesn't. Can't hear what you're talking about. Okay, what what he what he was saying was we were trying to determine if in this can is it clear without any wax, or does yes, it have wax? It is, because wax will hog the nozzle. Yeah. So the spray, any of the spray cans is non-wax. Okay, thank you. That's good to know. Thank you very much. So, so what I heard was, because I was trying to figure it out too, and I wondered, there's nothing on the can. All right, all right. All right, take it easy. Relax. What I did is I was researching it myself to find out. So I, I always read the labels, and there was no nothing telling me on the can that it was wax-free. And then I found an article on it and said it was wax that free. was uh, no wax in it. And I think it's because of what he just mentioned. Okay. That's okay? Good, very good to know. Okay. Okay, as far as as far as cleaning wood, as far as cleaning wood, as I discussed before briefly, when you have any kind of stains in a wood, like a mold stain or something, a fungus stain, 
You can use the oxalic acid. That does a great job, but you have to use it over the entire piece so that you have uniformity. If you're cleaning just wood that's just kind of grimy and such, this is a fantastic product, quick and bright. It's biodegradable. It cleans a million things. It cleans upholstery. It emulsifies grease and grime, any kind of a dirt. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't damage the wood at all. It leaves almost like a smooth patina. You can, you can dissolve it in a, in a warm or a hot uh, water bath and use it as a spray. It's a terrific cleaning pro uh, product. It's amazing on furniture. If you get grease or grime on your furniture, this stuff will take it out. I always used to use less oil, but my wife's very kind of environmentally sensitive. Anytime I clean something with less oil, oh my God, less oil again. And she hated the smell, and it is. It smells like a petroleum distillate. It's, this stuff smells like baby fresh clean. And it's relatively cheap, and this, this goes a long, long way. You don't need a, a lot. So if you need to clean anything, even wood, quick and bright, yes. Where do you get it? Amazon. Amazon. I get everything on Amazon. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, before you end today, could uh, you deviate just slightly from the general talk? I'm intrigued by what you said. You and Tom McLaughlin were working on a table, and you used mineral spirits on it, followed by shellac. That's right. Uh, could you elaborate on that when you're finished with the, the general talk? Well, I, I can tell you now. We, we, he, it was a cherry table. And this was a new, a, a new brand new table that he had constructed. He, he, we sanded it all to uh, 220. He blew it off with the compressor. Then we rubbed it with, uh, with rags and uh, uh, no, j just to clean it. J rubbed it with rags and, uh, and uh, sticky stuff. Then when it was all clean, then we took mineral spirits, high-end mineral spirits. He took one side, I took the other, and we rubbed it on with a rag. What, what was the reason for the mineral spirits if the wood was a, a clean, clear Fresh new wood. He, he likes the look of the oil underneath the shellac. It gives it a little more depth. And, and I have found that to be the case after using that technique myself. I always like to put an oil finish underneath. And then if I, I want a little more protection, I'll put the shellac over. But I, I thought once the mineral spirits evaporated, you just had a, uh, you had either nothing or a resin left behind. There's, there's an oil left behind? Sure, or? yeah. It'll continue to bleed depending on how much you, you put on there. And then oh. once it stops bleeding, it's just like it, you, know, you can put mineral spirits on a cutting board. It'll be smooth for a while. And then eventually, it, as you say, it, it kind of evaporates off. But when you seal it with the shellac, it maintains that depth under there. Mineral oil. I'm sorry. Not mineral oil. Mineral oil. Oil. I'm sorry. Mineral oil. Mineral oil. Thank you. Thank you. Mineral oil. Uh, mineral oil. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about waxes because I think it's really important. Um, I like to make my own. And what I do is, is I, I buy these bricks of, uh, of beeswax and I'll melt these and I'll usually melt them with some carnauba depending on the percentage that I want. I either use the carnauba flakes like this or I, I use bricks of carnauba. They're a little harder to come by for me anyway. I, the flakes are a little cheaper. And you can make, I mean, this this will make, with some carnauba, a whole can of polish, and this cost me eight bucks. You know, this can of Brie Wax is uh, $22. And then you, I'll add a little turpentine, sometimes a little mineral spirits. Turpentine is a great emol. Yes? Mineral oil. Mineral oil? Yeah, right, yeah, I know. Right, right, mineral oil. Thank you. Speak well. All right. Um, some, sometimes I will combine them in different combinations depending on what I want to do with them. Um, but I find that I can make a pound of finish for a hell of a lot less than I can buy it for, and I can make it suited to my needs, which I really like. Now, let's talk about different waxes, because I think this is really important. I was at a conference in um, for uh, fine woodworking and I and I had the opportunity to have a really extensive discussion with Terry Masashi who I know many of you know 
who's a world-class finishing expert, one of the only people I've ever heard openly criticize Bob Flexner, which I found very <laughs> illuminating. <laughs> anyway, Terry was really nice because I asked her a million questions, and I was talking about wax, and I use a lot of Brie wax because I find Brie wax is a fabulous cleaning wax. It will take unbelievable amounts of dirt and grime and grease off of a piece and leave a beautiful uh, patina with a minimal amount of finishing. Sometimes I'll get an antique piece that the average person would think they'd have to strip, sand, and refinish, and I can clean it with Brie Wax, and it comes out really, really more than satisfactory. So she said to me, ah, Brie Wax is okay. I don't really like it that much. And I was like, oh. And I said, well, why is that, Terry? She goes, it's really not hard enough. So I said, well, in what respect? She goes, well, when, you know, when, when people make pieces of furniture, they want a wax that's really hard so that they don't get any finger smudges and that it doesn't, doesn't smear easily. She says, and I find Brie Wax doesn't have that level of hardness, which I'd have to say to a certain extent I agree, unless you really buff it aggressively. So I said, what do you like to use? She goes, there's only one wax for me. She says, Staples Wax has an incredibly high, if not all, Carnuba content. And guess where Staples Wax is made? I didn't know that. So of course, Merrimack here in New Hampshire. So of course I went out and got a can. She's absolutely correct. Staples, just like the store, right, like Staples. Store. It's a fabulous wax with a hugely high, if not all, carnauba content. It buffs to a tremendous lustrous finish, and it stays really hard, and it does not smudge. It's a great, great, great wax. Yes, sir? I've used that. It's not as hard as this. Tree wax, T R E W A X. Tree wax. Tree wax, yes. The other wax that I found that's almost as hard is this by Lundmark. Also has a very, very, very high carnauba wax content. Now, both these waxes are great for finishing purposes. They do a great job when you've put on your nice film finish, your shellac or whatever, and then you want to buff out with four odd steel wool. Either one of these waxes will do a great job. This wax, which is very highly publicized, is very, very, very soft. When you put this on and you buff it out, the finish feels very soft, but it's not hard. You get fingerprints. It, it just isn't a good hard finish. I mean, if it's something you're never going to touch, it's great. <laughs> but if you're going to handle it, not a good finish. And this is highly touted and very expensive. I bought a ton of these cans that somebody was just looking to get rid of. And I rarely, rarely, rarely use it unless it's going to be on something like Fiddies. Fiddies. F-I-D-D-E-S. Fiddies. Now, the reason I love Brie Wax so much is Brie Wax is a fantastic cleaning wax. It can take off things that you can't imagine, even on metals. I'll use steel wool and Brie Wax on old tools. It takes off old paint. It takes off grime and grease. It's just phenomenal. And the same on wood. And leaves a fairly nice patina. The only problem with Brie Wax is, is the emulsifying agent, and it is toluene, which is, which is carcinogenic. It's toxic. So if you're going to use this stuff a lot like I do, I always wear gloves, and I always wear nitrile gloves, and I always wear high-end nitrile gloves because they're not all the same quality, at least six mil or better. And then you're fine, you know? If you rub hard enough, it probably will. But, I mean, I'm, I'm looking to do that because – Whatever's going on in the wood that I'm using this on, I want to get all that off of there. And sometimes, even if there's a finish on there, I like a wax finish sometimes better than a film finish. It feels much nicer, for example. Is that considered a hard wax or soft? Brie wax is, is probably intermediate. Let, let him feel that. 
th this this side of the plane was was no, that gentleman there. Let him let him feel that. Just that 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 side there. That's that that was the plane that I purchased. It was it was was full of mold and all kinds of stains. I just rubbed that one side for five minutes with some Brewax and and steel wool, and you feel. I mean, it's such a nice, soft, smooth patina and cleaned up really nicely. I thought relative to how it was when I bought it. You couldn't do that with most other waxes. Well, the only other thing I was concerned with is some uh, paint uh, mixture that I used to So, you know, here you go put a nice shellac finish on a piece of furniture. You put a nice uh, shellac finish on a piece of furniture, and then you put toluene on top of it. Well, here's the thing: toluene evaporates, so it does. It's not like it stays in the wood. It's it's used as the emulsifying agent, like the to to make it a liquid. But it it evaporates. It it, it gases off, so it's not going to stay in the wood. But the problem is, is that off gassing is toxic if you breathe a lot of it. For the most part, you don't. But if, if you're keeping it on your hands, like a lot of people I watch that refinish, don't wear gloves. You don't want to put your hands in brie wax without gloves for an extended period of time. Not good. Yes, I have a uh, question on the uh, Brie Wax. I, I'm trying to remember. I think I bought some Brie Wax in, in a brown color. Yes, it's, it's got a million different shades. Yeah. Oak, brown. But it, I, I was surprised. It was very, uh, when I opened up the can, it was. Slushy. Thin, it was, right? It was thin. Yes. You know, wet. I mean, it was, it, yes. it was not like a heavy paste at all. No, you got to put it in a refrigerator sometimes. This tends to emulsify in the can, get very liquidy at about 75 degrees. Once you get to 75 or 80, you'll open it up sometimes, it'll be a li really a liquid. I throw it in the refrigerator and then it's fine. In the winter, it's like a normal wax. But it, you're absolutely well, that's correct. That's what you do. Okay, because yep. I wondered, I, I tried using it, but it wasn't, didn't really work. No, put it in the refrigerator, it'll be, but put it in a plastic bag so your food doesn't smell like brie wax. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mike. Yes, sir. Did somebody else have a question? Oh, okay. yeah, he's going to get to that. The Renaissance, you're going to get to it, right? But I have a question for us for you. You go ahead. How come with all the waxes you get up there, all this most popular wax that you see everywhere you go is Johnson's? How about that wax? Is it good? For furniture, it's crap. It's crap. Okay. For, for, um, for, for wax, the old Johnson's was great for waxing the top of your tools to put, you know, they call them table saw and stuff Bowling it was great areas. for that but the new the new constituents of johnson's is nowhere near as hard as the old stuff it's 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 pretty garbage okay. unfortunately what about butcher's wax? if you can get some of the really hard butcher's wax that also is very good very hard because again there's a, a much higher canuba content to that Look, look on eBay. Oh, okay. As, as, a, as a famous man once said, eBay is your friend. Yeah. And no, his name is Peter. Anyway, and it, that's really true. Yeah. There are people that have bought up loads of things and they may have old, you know, old new stock. Yeah. And you may find some of the older stuff and just, just, I call them up or email them and say, look, is this, is this manufactured prior to 1952 or something? And they'll say, oh. yes. You know, they'll communicate. A lot of these guys, they want a relationship. You, you'd be surprised at how many people I actually can call on the phone and say, what are you going to put on next week? Let me know because I, I want to I be awake for the bid. What about those little containers of Renaissance wax? Oh, yeah. Renaissance wax is the finest wax for conservation purposes. It's a micro-crystalline wax. This is what all of the museums use to work on their fine pieces. You almost need nothing to put on a piece. I bought this last year and I use it a lot. That's how much is I've used out of it. It's unbelievable. I just touch my finger in. Does, put, does it dry? It says it dries. It does. You just buff it. It buff it and it's dry. But it's a phenomenal finish. It's really, really exquisite. It's just amazing. Uh, it's very expensive. eBay, every once in a while, though, has sales on it. I've seen it. I bought this, I think, for like 
eighteen dollars. Normally it's like twenty six dollars. I got it for eighteen. They sell a big tub of it. If any of you guys want to go halfsies on a big tub, I'll split it with you. That's a lot cheaper. Are all the other waxes up there petroleum based? I, I know most of them have a petroleum distillate. This doesn't. This is a great just the polishing wax. There's a uh, there's a conservator or refinisher up in Maine. His name is Thomas Johnson. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Um, he has a uh, finishing business up in Gore, Maine. He does a ton of videos on YouTube. Really, really a very skilled man and a lot of variety. He does carvings, all kinds of stuff. He uses this exclusively as the final polishing component on his furniture. It's, it's a wax and oil base together, which I think is excellent. And I like those two components, wax and oil. And what's the name of that? It's called Howard's Feed and Wax. Howard's Feed and Wax. Great polish and, and relatively inexpensive. I think I got this on eBay. I got a deal for six of them for like seven twenty-four dollars each. Is, is, that's, is that the same as the uh, stuff they use on cutting boards or is that no, a different? No, no, no. This isn't, this isn't food safe. Food, food safe stuff has to either be mineral spirits, walnut oil, something like that. Walnut, min, mineral, mineral oil as opposed to mineral spirits. Well, what you want to do is mineral spirits and then you put a match next to it. And you... Okay, uh, uh, just a little bit about sharpening again. The other day on eBay, I noticed as I was looking for uh, some files to sharpen my saws, uh, one of the best sharpening companies in the world, Tome Ferreira from Portugal, had a special on six inch uh, extra slim tapered files for saws. They normally go for like seven, eight, nine dollars each. I got a dozen for forty-four dollars. Fabulous deal. There's a guy, forget his name, who apparently has bought up hundreds of thousands of dollars of their stock when they went out of business. And every once in a while, he puts so much stuff on the on eBay. He's a really nice guy. I've spoken to him on the phone. If you can ever get your hand on a Tome Ferreira set of files, they're without equal. I mean, they're durable. They already have like a coating on them that kind of helps with when you first start. They last a long time. They're very sharp. It's a real, really good quality file, Tome Ferreira. Uh, just in, in closing, I started a, uh, a furniture refurbishing business this year, just because I was a little bored. And the first project I had was a woman came to me and said, my dog ate my spindles, my stretchers. I said, oh, can you fix these for me? I said, I think so. What I didn't know was, when I tried taking these apart, most, most wind, this is a Windsor chair. Most Windsor chairs are either, if they're vintage antique, they glue with hide glue, or they're glued with some kind of an allophactic glue, yellow glue, white glue. The repair that was done on these was glued with epoxy. And I sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there for hours, trying not to burn this up, which you can see I accomplished that, trying to release it with just heat in it, it would not come apart. I didn't know what to do. And I was starting to panic because I had this for a long time. So I emailed my good buddy, Terry Masachi, and I said, hi, Terry, remember me, the guy that talked your ear off? And she was very charming. And I explained the problem, and she says, well, there's something that you can do. I said, great. She said, what you can do is drill small micro holes all around the spindle inject some kind of solvent like toluene or naphtha or something in there. She says, then I'm going to tell you the next thing to do, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but it works. just have to be very careful. She said, apply heat. And I'm thinking to myself, toluene and heat, that kind of equals explosion. And she said, if you apply too much heat, it will explode. <laughs> so I was like, thanks a lot, Terry. She says, but if you apply it, take it away, apply it. She says, if it starts to smoke, she said, stand back and move away very quickly. She says, I would also suggest, she says, are you a turner? I said, yes. She says, wear your face mask when you do it. So I was like really scared. But I, I drilled the holes, 
and I applied the heat. I injected. I have a, one of those high pressure syringes that I use for furniture fixing, and I injected. I, I think I used naphtha all through, heated it, pulled away, heated, pulled, and I put spreader clamps on it. And then all of a sudden, I heard a pop, and I thought it was an explosion, and it came apart. So that worked, but it wouldn't be something I'd, I'd ever recommend. Yes, sir. And he would drill holes in where the joints were, but had steam going in. I tried the steam. It didn't work. Not, not on the epoxy. Maybe I couldn't get the steam in far enough because I didn't have a needle for the steam. You have I to only have had a the head. That, that may have been you have the to have difference. A needle. That may have been the difference. I could not get it apart. I was going out of my mind. I was all ready to just cut it and then just re drill it, and I really didn't want to do that. So I just. The story with the screw and the vice there. Oh, okay. Let me, let me just finish this and I'll. So anyway, I replaced these, and uh, I was working with a woman. And this was a. Uh, that was the Windsor chair. I was working with a woman. And we got a commission for a Lincoln rocker. And when it came to us, it was in pieces. And it was, hold that up to where it's good for them to see. It was tremendously damaged. And she goes, can you, can you put this back together? And I said to her, I don't know, Mary Ann, it's pretty messed up. She says, this is for an elderly woman. And she really wants it. And I mean, I felt so bad. I said, all right, all right. She says, the guy doesn't have any money. I said, well, what else is now? <laughs> so I gave him a, like a ridiculously reasonable price, and, and, and he was like, oh, you really you could do it for that? I said, I, yeah, I guess so. Just don't tell my wife. And uh, we put it back together, and uh, I was able to remove all of the finish using a whole bunch of different – because the, the grime was incredible – the biggest problem was at the top, there was this very ornate carving that was damaged. And I'm not a very proficient carver. And because he wasn't so interested in the integrity of the vintage piece, he just wanted it to look nice. I said, I can recarve these pieces, but I have to take off from one side to make the other side even, if you understand. He says, do whatever you need to do. Just make it look balanced, have symmetry. So I did that, and it came out nice. And I used... Um, all kinds of very stiff nylon brushes with some solvents to get all the grime out of there. And then I polished it all. And then what I did was um, I bought a bunch of these horsehair brushes from Amazon. And when I put different waxes and polishes in, I was able to polish all inside the grooves with these brushes. It came out. I, I, was, I was impressed. I was like, who did that? It really looked nice. Um, so you'd be surprised at what you can do if you just take the time and the effort and you, and, you, and you watch some of the videos. I mean, a lot of this I learned was from that Thomas Johnson. Go on, on uh, YouTube and look at thomasjohnson.com. He has hundreds of videos for anything from veneer fixing, clocks, making new parts, making new legs, turning things. Uh, you name it, he... he has done it, and he gives you a step-by-step, -step, not like he talks about it. The whole hour video is him fixing a particular segment of something. You, you will really learn so much. How much did it cost you as opposed to what you charged her? Uh, probably cost me $75 in materials, and I charged him $150. So, I mean, to me, it's not about making money. I just love... I love to fix something that's old and making it new probably because I'm getting old and I'd like someone to fix me and not throw me away. <laughs> you were going to have us uh, tell us how not to do that. Oh, yes. Okay. When you look at this finish, to me, you see all this crazing and such. Whoever finished this put a very thick kind of a film finish on this and then tried to rub it out just a little bit. The finish wasn't good to begin with. They put way too much finish on this brass. They made it look very kind of cheap. And then what happened when all this crazing occurred, all they did was kind of either buff, try to buff it out with some wax or something. I'm going to scrape this on both sides. Then I will sand this brass. I'll use oil on it. And then 
if the oil is, if it's a little too dull, I may use shellac, but hopefully I can just get away with oil and wax. This, I'll show you guys at another time, this will then look like a million dollars. Because it's, it's really nice wood, it just wasn't finished properly. Oh, this thing here, I brought this, I'm sorry. This thing here is called a miter jack. I was at, a, um, at an auction in Maine, and I'm walking up and down the aisles, and I had only seen one of these online one time. And this guy had this, and it was, it was all full of dirt and white stuff and looked terrible. And, and I'm looking at it, and the threads were in perfect condition, which you rarely see on these. Usually on these, you see a lot, a lot of chip threads. This has one little tiny, uh, one little tiny uh, spot. The rest of the threads are in mint condition. So I said to the guy, well, what do you want for that? He goes, oh, I don't know, 40 bucks? So I'm like, oh. So I tried to look disinterested, which is how you have to be as an auctioner. And I walked away and I came back and I looked up on eBay and I saw two of them. One was $240 in completely crappy condition. One was $260 in a little better condition, not as good as this. And I hadn't even seen what it looked like fixed. So I went back, I said, would you take 35? And he goes, yeah, I'll take 35. <laughs> Couldn't get home fast enough. And then I cleaned it up just with, with mineral spirits. I cleaned it up with mineral spirits. And then I used Brie wax on it. And you can see the condition of it. And it cost me $35. And it's beautiful. It's called a miter jack. What they used to do was they would take this take this piece and they would put it in the vise so it was held firmly and then they would take a piece of wood like let's say and you'd put that in the vise like this and now you had a reference point for cutting a 45 and that's how they would cut their 45s quickly throw them in cut it cut it cut it cut it and then they would just just tighten them like this and it held it guide in your soul so I was like, I was thrilled because I, I mean, I'd only seen two of them. Yes. And planing. I, I read an article. That's what I thought too. But they said cutting and planing. Because if you look on here, there's actual saw marks. So I think people use them for both, but also planing. But to me, it's such dense oak. Just the patina of the wood alone was an inducement for me to to buy it and I got a great price again you got to go to these auctions you got to stop by see what people have look at it take your time if you absolutely the thing is I, I I'm trying to convince my good friend Peter to get a smartphone when I go to these auctions I go down the next dial and I get on my smartphone and I can look up a hundred different articles and things on what it's worth you know from eBay pint interest all these places, so I have a real good sense of what the value it is. And sometimes I just buy things because they're valuable, and then I can refurbish them and give them to somebody, and I know I've given them some quality. I right. heard Pete was the guy responsible for having these good ones. Yes, he is, and I thank him for it every day. <laughs> yes, sir. At the beginning of this, you presented some sort of study that said that people could hold people's attention how long? Wrong. 50 minutes. Yes, Mike. This is one of the best presentations. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.